watching The Producer's Room, a streaming web series featuring the creators behind the hit songs of today's music industry. Songwriters, music producers, and artists discuss their creative process as well as examining current issues and technologies in today's rapidly changing music business. Your host is producer, songwriter, and educator, Dave Tuff. Welcome to The Producer's Room. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of The Producer's Room. Once again, we're coming to you from the historic House of David Studios here on Music Row in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm really excited about our guest today, Josh Leo, and I wanted to read just a little bit about Josh's background so I can introduce him before we actually start talking to him. Josh Leo is one of those rare talents who's at home behind the console as he is in front of the mic, comfortable writing and analyzing chords and picking hit songs for other artists. And Personally, when I study Josh's background, he's really one of those those Renaissance men that Renaissance men that wears a lot of hats. He's been a producer, uh, a hit producer, hit songwriter, um, session musician on a lot of hits, and also a record company exec. Um, along with his work as a producer, producing an amazing 23 number one singles. Uh, like I said, Josh has been on 150 records throughout the years as a session guitarist. He penned six number one singles himself as a songwriter, Alabama's Down Home, Hometown Honeymoon, Restless Hearts, Tell Me What You Dream, and other songs by Kenny Chesney, Leanne Rimes, Reba McIntyre, The Wreckers, Brenda Lee, Jimmy Buffett, the list goes on and on. But it's not just yesterday because Josh is involved with the music industry today, obviously, as well. Um, he had a couple hits uh, recently, one with Dustin Lynch, who was, uh, who cut um uh, produced the song, Josh produced the song Cowboys and Angels, peaked at number two, um, and he was also the producer of the number one single for Love and Theft, Angel Eyes on RCA Records. And you may have also heard of a name, Martina McBride, I think everyone's heard of Martina, and uh, Josh was the one who brought her on uh, to the label when he was at RCA as VP of a &R. Is that correct, Josh? Yes, that All is right. correct. Well, Anyway, long introduction, but uh, you certainly deserve it, and I appreciate you being on the producer's room today. It's my pleasure <laughs> today to be here. Very cool. So we were just, once again, we're, we're here at the House of David Studios. We were just looking at this fancy white API console, because there's not too many white API consoles like this. And you said, that looks familiar. It looks very familiar, <laughs> and uh, um, I said, I may have worked on this if it's what I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, this console has a history of its own, which I'm not sure if we've gotten into, but it was out in Los Angeles. Um, that's what I'm told, and that's what you remember, right? Yes. I, if, if this is the correct console, which I believe it yeah. is, uh, Kim Carnes, I performed on that album, uh, with, which had Betty Davis eyes, Yeah, was on this um, also. My fir very first production, Timothy B. Schmidt of the Eagles, was on this Wow. Um, I have done a solo record, my uh, uh, my own solo record on this console. Uh, Randy Meisner, a uh, few other people. Yeah. Um, so um, wow. it's, it's nice to feel it, <laughs> feel feel it an again. actual console. Yeah. Um, Timothy B. Schmidt, that's cool. That may actually get us into talking about your transition from a session guitarist to maybe a producer. So you said you worked with him. Had you produced before working with Timothy? No, um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I had um, I was doing sessions as a session guitar player, and um, a producer who at the time was just a record producer out there, Jim Ed Norman, who yeah. e ended up moving here and running Warner Brothers for years, called me and asked me if I would play on a Glenn Fry record, uh, his first solo record, and um, I not only it's got not a bad to, call. <laughs> no, I was yeah. very excited. I got to play on it. We hit it off. He asked me to go on the road with him. Went on the road for two years, two albums uh, with Glenn. And during that time period, he uh, heard a tape of some of my songs and wanted to know who produced them. Okay. And I told him that I did, and he he said he had a friend <laughs> who needed a producer. <laughs> Um, and, uh, after I said, sure, then he told me his friend was Timothy B. Schmidt. Wow. So, um, that was my very first production. That is pretty cool. On this console. We think yes. on this yes. console. We, yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and you were just telling me, and I was, I was just saying, man, that was my favorite period in LA, the late seventies, early eighties. And that, that crew of musicians you got on there were some of the guys from Toto and some of the big session guys. Yeah. It and, was, uh, uh, Jeff Percaro on yeah. drums, David Page on keyboards. Lukather on guitar, 
And then we had some guests come in. We had right. uh, Graham Nash came in, um, Don Henley came in, uh, Carl Wilson from the Beach Boys came in, all of these people. Wow. So this is my very, <laughs> I'm thinking, this is how it's going to be. Right, wow. You know, uh, you just yeah. call up these uh, very famous people and they come in and yeah. uh, they sing on your records. Yeah. Um, so I get, you know, I, I want to move into production when you're talking about that. So you have that level of talent. Do you, are you really, I mean, this is, sounds kind of, you know, assuming, but are you really doing too much as a producer? I mean, what is your role when you have this great talent on the floor? It's very um, interesting because the, the, the uh, first couple of takes that we did yeah. on the very first song, um, I, I sat mesmerized uh -huh. because, I mean, he, these yeah. are guys that I, I, I love and I worship. And uh, the engineer, after one of the takes, goes... You, you have to say something. Right, They're right. all looking at you. So I practiced the talk back and I said, hey guys, that was great. Come on in. Yeah. And so they all came back in and they listened about halfway through. Lukather stops the tape and looks at me and goes, you got to elevate your game, kid. That's crap. Wow. And then they all walked out to do it again. So then I thought, okay, what I think is good and what uh -huh. they think is good is a whole other level. Yeah. So yeah. I, I was... Um, thrown into the fire and learning as I sure. went on that record. And sure. Timothy was very gracious with me. He sat down and showed me a lot of um, tips on how to isolate things and and get the best performance. Um, a lot of the things that the Eagles were doing. I mean, you'd time. been on the other side of the glass before. Obviously. I'd been on the other side of the glass, and but I was always, as a session player, you're you're, you're thinking more of okay, how was my performance? Right. And so you're not really in charge of everyone else's performance. And honestly, if you're going to be a good session player, kids, if you're going to be a good <laughs> session player, let me tell you something. Do not criticize other players, yeah. what they're doing. Just worry about what you're supposed to do and do, yeah. do that. And um, keep your chatter to a minimum, <laughs> basically. So, but 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 let's even talk about that. Is there a job for a session player anymore? We live in Nashville, right? Yes. Um, and we still, I mean, I think you would agree, live in a town that has some great musicians, and they play. Um, but how many musicians comp comprise that team? And is there still a, is a gig for a session player? One of the great things about this town, even though it's slowed down, yeah, is that the songwriting community is constantly making demos. Yes, yes. And so that is the way that I and Dan Huff and everybody, all the session musician greats, mm -hmm. Reggie Young and everybody, you start doing demos. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. You need to... Get learn in the there, number system. Learn, learn how to the number play with system. Other people. Learn how to play. It's ki it's kindergarten. Mm -hmm. Learn how to mm -hmm. play well with others. <laughs> right, right. Okay, and don't try to impress people about your chops, about how many notes you can play. Right, it's right. not about the no how many notes. It's about playing the right notes. Mm -hmm. Laying out is just as important mm -hmm. as playing mm -hmm. when you're doing a session. Uh, having control to to say. It's the keyboard players filling right. this verse or, or the other guitar player sure. or whatever sure. it is. Um, know your role and yeah. just do your role. Be a great role player. Um, you start with demos and you work your way up. The good news is there's a lot of demos going on, so there's always uh, a call for musicians. Um, and there's a time limit. It's kind of an invisible line, but you get to be the guy for so long and then suddenly mm -hmm. almost overnight it's mm -hmm. like i don't want to use dave anymore right. everybody the, used the flavor dave. Of the i don't want to use dave hey i got a new guy yeah. over here joey who's right. really good <coughs> and he's got a few more uh pedals or <laughs> he's got a few more tricks or right. he knows some pop music a little better yeah. than dave yeah. does yeah. or whatever the flavor is um i wouldn't get discouraged i i really think that there's always going to be a need for new blood. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, when we're talking about dealing with players and even maybe maybe the trends that, that happen, um, what's your view on the role of a producer to either keep up with radio or perhaps even push beyond and see the future of what's going to happen in two years? 
uh, or th four years on the radio. I mean, how do you need to think as far as knowing the market um, as a producer? I could be, you know, cutting my own throat. Yeah. I, I always try to be the leader. I always try to be ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. I always, um, because it, remember, you're recording right now mm -hmm. in December and the record's not coming out till June or July right. or something. And that period of time, if you're following what's going on in radio at that time in December, mm -hmm. that could be over or it could be on its way out. Right. You could be following the bro country rap yep. thing. Yep. And then Chris Stapleton comes along and wins <laughs> all these awards and you're like, yeah. I should have right. followed my heart and, and, yeah. and uh, I should have followed my instinct of trying to be on the cutting edge yes as opposed to that so i think it's always better i would encourage young producers to uh, be you know the the new guy even though you may kill a couple of careers in the, <laughs> yeah. In, yeah. in the balance Push, of it. some boundaries and but trying, yeah. trying to see ahead. Well, I wanted to I'd take a quick step back. Um, we know we kind of got into the producing thing real quick. Um, where are you from, and did you grow up in a musical family, start playing guitar early, that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, I am uh, was born in Des Moines, Iowa, mm -hmm. and then uh, at a, around 11 years old, my dad got transferred, and we moved to Kansas City, Missouri, my, my dad played trumpet in uh, swing bands, um, but gave it up early on as mm -hmm. a full-time occupation, but still played around the house all the time. And I had an older brother who was a drummer, and he started playing when he was 13, and I started playing guitar when I was 11. Mm -hmm. And so we would... Uh, I was one of those guys that watched the Beatles. I'm that old. I watched the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. So um, when I saw Ringo, the Beatles, Ringo's drum set just sold, you saw it uh, yes. for like 1.2 million. Yeah. yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I saw them and said, that's what I want to do. Um, and I, so yes, long story short, I grew up in a musical family. My dad and mom supported my brother and I to follow our dreams. Um, I moved to Chicago right out of high school fell in a band with some people, moved out to L.A., mm -hmm. and then it all started for me. So you were really L.A. and then to Nashville. To it Nashville. wasn't like you started in Nashville, went out there and came back. No, Huff started here, went out yeah. and came back. Um, you kind of really, did a triangle. Uh, yeah. Case, KC to L.A. to... Well, LA. Chicago, Chicago first. Oh, Chicago, yeah, Chicago yeah. first. And, and when I was in Chicago, I uh, got a chance to... Um, learn how to play the blues nice. from from uh, a lot of the South Side people and stuff. So um, anyway, yeah. you, you don't get to use that very often, but it but it's mm -hmm. nice to know how to do that. But anyway, moved to Los Angeles, uh, mid-70s, and uh, fell into the, uh, the Southern California mm -hmm. click. Yeah. Got really lucky and um, and then decided that I wanted to raise a family, and it was yeah. either New York or Nashville. And right, I, right. I thought Nashville was yeah. a better place. I had Jimmy Bowen, a friend of mine, and Jim Ed Norman, a friend of mine, were producing here. Mm -hmm. I decided, yeah. you know what, let me let me go down there. So you did the Timothy gig. Yes, out and, there. And out there. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, you wanted to move here for your family. So how did it, how long did it take to get your feet on the ground here, both as a player, as a writer? Um, uh -huh. I, as a player, it didn't take long because I was already yeah, doing sessions here. Yeah. I, I would fly down here to do sessions for Jim Ed during the early 80s and for Jimmy Bowen during the early 80s. Um, but as when I thought about producing, living in Los Angeles on one of those sessions, I, I took a meeting with Jim Ed and I said, you know, I just finished this Timothy B. Schmidt record. I'm ready to start producing. Um, and he said, great. Let me call all the artists on Warner Brothers and tell them there's a guy you've never heard of that doesn't live here that wants to produce you. <laughs> and I said, yeah. so what are you saying? Yeah. He goes, move here and get right, in line, right. just like everybody else. Right. So kids, there's a line. <laughs> uh, you yeah. know, I hate to say it, once you get out of college, there's yeah. a line that you have to get into. And it took me three years, two and a half years before I got my first production here. 
So did that then blossom into songwriting, or had you been writing I've songs been, when you were I've out? been writing yeah. songs okay. from Kansas cool. City. All right, we're going to get right back to that songwriting thing here in a minute. But before that, we're going to take a short break. So we'll see you guys in just a minute. What would a degree from Belmont University mean to you? I'm so proud of you, darling. Maybe it's time you found out. Thanks, Dad. I can't believe I finally did it. Belmont University Adult Degree Program. Finish what you started. Welcome back to the producer's room. Once again, we're here at the historic House of David Studios. And I say historic, but it's a fully operational studio here on Music Row, and I'm just looking over here, and they got a 24-track analog machine and a Burl, 32-channel uh, Burl converter and a nice little API console that uh, Josh and I were just talking about. So uh, back to the songwriting, Josh. Um, once again, as I said in the intro, you're one of these people that fascinate me because you've worn all of these hats, and I can just think, you know, count on one hand, like maybe someone like Quincy Jones that has worn the, the business hat, the songwriter hat, the, the producer hat. How did you, you know, come into the songwriting thing? Had you always been writing songs? Um, it seems like some of your six real big successes, though, happened here in Nashville, right? Yeah, I, I, I think uh, if it, it, you can break down my career as a session player, uh -huh. Los Angeles. Okay. The birth of a producer, right? Los Angeles. Right. Okay. Um, the wising up and <laughs> figuring out this isn't going to last. Yeah. Let's go to Nashville. Uh, but I'd been writing songs all along, and um, for yourself as an artist, for, for others, my, for myself as an yeah. artist, starting off, mm -hmm. and then when I got a couple of co-writes on Timothy B. Schmidt's record. I started realizing, okay, this this is the way to go because yeah. you can, if you're going to be a producer, you might as well try to get um, yeah. your songs at least maybe right with the artist mm -hmm. if you can. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started really developing that. And I thought, just like everybody else, you think you're a really good songwriter until you move here. Right, right. And then you find out, what a really good songwriter mm -hmm. is when you run into Tim Nichols or Craig Wiseman or the list of, you know, the people. The craft of, of songs. Yeah, yeah and just... so this is the mid-80s. <coughs> um, I remember having uh, my first number one, Crystal Gale, 1984, a song called Baby, What About You, had a number one party, and one of the uh, songwriters, it might have been Rory Burke or some, one of those guys, uh, walked up to me and said, congratulations on your number one. And I said, thanks, man. I'm real excited. He goes, is this your f only one? <laughs> and I went, what? And he goes, well, you only got one? And then I found out, you know, he had already had like 35 oh or gosh. whatever. Yeah. So um, yeah. y you really have to dig in down here. Right. I mean, th this, is the, this is the big leagues. Nashville is the so big So did your craft... Songs develop over time or were you ready when you hit the ground in Nashville no, or were you I, learning through other co-writes? I, I was or? learning through co-writes yeah. just like every, yeah. just like you should, right. basically. You should learn through co-writes. Yeah. Try to uh, be, and I know this is kind of hard, but try to be the worst writer in the room at all times. <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you're not going to gain anything. Try to be the, the worst player in a band, <laughs> you know, try to be the worst session player. Uh, and, and what I mean by that is you're only going to get better. If you're the best songwriter, you're, you're mm -hmm. um, pulling, you know, if there's two other people in there, you're doing most of the work and the other two people, um, you, you, you need to learn. And mm -hmm. the best way to learn is to put your ego aside and try to get in with people that know more about it and, and do it better than you do. Right. Now, now for those, because we have viewers all over the world, for those viewers that are not in Nashville, um, can't, I mean, a lot of people aren't even used to that concept of co-writing. So maybe an NSAI chapter. I'm just trying to think of how they could connect with NSAI or a is, lot of these a, is a uh, great yeah uh, boards on on the internet nowadays. They could probably hook up with someone in their area, but just like songwriter boards or yeah, and it, and it's it, it, collaboration is good songwriting wise. It will lead to um, uh, 
you know, now there's two of you trying right. to to get yeah. your song cut as opposed to just one person. Yeah. I mean, it just makes sense. Yeah, I, well, I agree. Um, and, to do that, and and you never know if you're a, if you're lucky enough to be a signed songwriter at a publishing company, and you write with another signed songwriter at another publishing company. Now you have two song pluggers pitching your song as opposed to just mm -hmm, one mm -hmm. or three. Um, Double those those odds, yeah. yeah. So you need to <coughs> play well with others. So 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 you must have spent some time just really shedding on the songwriting thing. I mean, if it's like all these huge hits, it, I mean, was that your job for a while, and you put producing on the back burner, or have you been doing it all? I've been doing songwriting all along. Yeah. And when I first moved here, um, because Jim Ed Norman told me to get in line, right, as a producer. Uh, then the only thing I had time to do was write songs and sure. do some sessions. Sure. Um, and so I tried to learn as fast as I could. And and I, I just think that the talent down here is just yeah. so amazing. Go to, you know, if you want to learn how to get better, go to the clubs, go to the Bluebird, go to the right. different uh, in the rounds and, mm -hmm. and listen to these people and, and, and try to be objective and go, oh, that's a great song. Okay, right. my song is my song but it's not as good as that and yeah. oh i see what they did there in that second verse they turned it around and yeah um yep. this is your college right here yeah. after you get out yeah. of college yeah your your new college is <laughs> uh, on the street so i like where you're going with this and i, I want to talk more to our viewers about today's music industry and once again, how many hats do you have to wear? Let's say this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student studying at Berklee College of Music and I just want to be, I just want to play guitar and that's all I want to do is play jazz fusion guitar the rest of my life. You know, my question in my brain is how many jobs are there out there like that? You know, should someone like that diversify like you have done, learn how to write songs, learn how to compose, learn how to do you know, to work in a digital audio workstation, some of these other skills. Um, right. Or should they focus on just trying to be the best jazz fusion guitar player? I know that's it, kind of it, a weird it, example. It, but Well, it depends on, no, yeah. it's not actually, because uh, the wrecking crew, the guys yeah. that made the, the records during the 60s were all jazzers. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, do you think that, I mean, you probably do, but I don't go home and listen to country music. I mean, right, I work right. in country music. I grew up in rock and roll music. Uh -huh. um, so just because I'm a producer for country music or write country songs or play on country records does not uh, keep yeah. me from being a jazzer. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. doesn't keep me from doing all of that right, uh, technical, the technical uh, yeah. and the chops and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, I think what you're trying to say is... If if you want to be successful, it's okay to broaden what you right. do, and, and and by broadening it, you may be playing less notes if you're yes. a jazz fusion yes. guy, but you're still learning uh, space. You're learning uh, the concepts of concepts of of, of, of music and how it fits together right. like this, right. not just soloing. Yeah. how the parts fit together. Sure. And, I th and then once again, if you want to be a producer when you grow up, that you have to know that. You know how the and, and and a jazz fusion player doing sessions. I mean, let's face it. I I was a rock guitar player doing sessions. I crawled out of the water onto the land. I became a <laughs> right. producer. It's evolution. Right. You, you work with enough bad or good producers, you learn what not yeah. to do as a session, uh, as a produ you know, if you're a session guy, you learn what to do or what not to do. Yeah. And they're yeah. both equally as important. Yeah, I agree. And when you get up there, it's so much nicer to have a producer that knows what it's like to be a session player, mm -hmm. that knows what's going through your mind, how to communicate to mm -hmm. that person, mm -hmm. how to get the best out of that person. Um, so we were we were just talking about the role of a, a producer, and you were telling me before the show, and you were telling me that sometimes people perceive it to be diff different than it actually is. So so there's that component of of just developing the the arrangements and all the parts fitting together, uh, but you were saying it's even more than that that people don't realize about some psychology is that right the, the, yeah there's a lot of child psychology involved <laughs> child in it. psychology involved. yes yes <laughs> um 
you, you need to, it's not always going to be a happy moment. It's not always going to be a sad moment. It's not always going to be an exciting moment. Uh, you have to weather the storms, mm -hmm. so to speak. I did one record with someone one time. Uh, I won't say who it is, but um, they had just broke up with their boyfriend and they were crying. And it was a sad song we were trying to record. And I just said, tell me about it, you know. And it was a she. And she was on the microphone just sobbing and sobbing. And I said, you know, I'm so sorry that this happened. Turned to the engine and I said, roll the tape. Oh. Roll the tape. Before she knew it, she was singing and her lip was kind of quivering in the last yeah. verse. And it was perfect. Oh, gosh. It was perfect. <coughs> so you, you got to yeah. kind of use some of yeah. that. Um, but more to your point just because you're the producer does not mean you are the end-all, be-all boss. Right. Okay? The more I produce, the more I realize my job is to make sure that the artist is always happy. If they, have, if they need water, if I need to get them water out there, if I need to get them food out there, if I need to have them take a break, if I need them to do whatever it is, I have to be really aware focusing on them mm -hmm. and being able to almost read their mind like they're getting tired i need to get hey you want a little candy bar right. or you want a little water right. or whatever, or whatever. same thing with the players you've got to know how to judge your players how to gauge them are you, know, you like one a, of those guys that's like well three takes and that's it or or oh, do definitely. Push, yeah. yeah definitely we're not doing, gonna get the magic i get the i get the <coughs> best players that i can get and now here's where dan and i differ a little bit yeah um and i love dan I have the most respect for him. In fact, I, 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 I'm i sorry he didn't mention me. I used him when he moved back here, too, Oh, uh -huh. on an Alabama record. Yeah. And he did say to me, I don't really know how to play country. <laughs> and I said, that's okay. I don't want you to play right, country. Right. I want you to be Dan Huff. Right, right. Um, but he he will cast, and I will do a little bit of casting, but I'm... Through the years, I used to do that, and now I'm in a phase where I'm more into the Muscle Shoals rhythm section thing. Just the Where solid. I get the same four, yeah. five, six guys. And they're versatile. And, and they're really versatile. Yeah. And only because the budgets have gotten smaller, yeah. Yeah. And, and you have less time to spend in there. And I've got to have guys that know each other. Yeah. Yeah, and that's true. And that I can say... And know you. and Hey, yeah. uh, we need to go to... And, and you, you say a couple of words. We need to go to Aretha Land. We uh -huh. need to go to uh -huh. Tower Power. Oh, we know. need to go to, yeah. you know, uh, uh, old uh, Hank stuff. And they know immediately well, what you're talking about. I think about. what you just said is really important just for our students is that you're pulling from a vocabulary of just music, of being a fan of music, being a consumer of music, that just even for you was like 50 years or 60 years deep there, of having those references that you can mention right on the spot as a producer. Yes. Um, There's a couple, how does one develop those? I'm just listening, right? Well, <laughs> that's the thing that I really want. If you, you guys want to learn something, if you get nothing else from this interview, <laughs> get this. Go back and learn from the masters. Go back 40, 50, 60 years. Find out who the Beatles were listening to before they became the Beatles, who people were listening, then, then people were listening to the Beatles and they became this. And people, you know, you, someone came to me just recently and said, I finally figured out where Michael Jackson got all his stuff from. James Brown. And it was like, of course it was James Brown. It was James right. Brown and a couple other people. But you need to go back and you need to research this stuff. It will make you a better songwriter. It'll make you a better player a better listener, and you'll be able to communicate to your players better. If you can say to them, if you have a vocabulary that spans back, you can say Led Zeppelin album two mm -hmm. when Paige was playing this or what, yeah. whatever it is that you need to do, whether it's that or it's mm -hmm. 90s rock, I don't care. Yes, yes. You've got to have that vocabulary. Right. And the other thing is always communicate I always communicate with my artists through musical vocabulary of hard examples. When, mm -hmm. when I'm getting together with you, if I'm going to make a record with you, mm -hmm. I'm going to try to In the pre-production pe yes, phase. Yes, pre-production yeah. phase. I'm going to find a picture <coughs> brain and find out all your influences and find out what yeah. kind of record you want to make. 
and I'm going to tell you, don't use words like, I want the snare to pop. Right. I want the snare to crack. Yeah. I want the, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, because it means yeah. Yeah. different things to all mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. I would rather you say, I like the drum sound on a Chili Peppers right. record, okay, right. and play it for me. Mm -hmm. Then I can go, okay, let me give that to the engineer, that information, so we can do that. Otherwise, yeah. we're dealing in abstracts. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Well, I'm looking forward to talking about more of that stuff. But before that, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to go fishing in the dark with our On the Record segment. We'll see you guys in a minute. All right. The town has this energy. You never know who you're going to bump into. We moved to Nashville and I started singing in clubs five nights a week. On any given night, you can go to the end and watch a show. You go to Tootsie's and watch a show. You go to Exit End, you go to the Ryman. They're sick musicians and sick singers. It doesn't surprise me, it's Music City. Welcome back to the producer's room here at the House of David Studios. This is what we call the on the record segment. <laughs> And uh, we said we were going to talk about Fishing in the Dark. But when you were, um, so you produced that record, yes, right? Yes, yes. And how many years ago was that? Almost 30. Oh, my gosh. And we were talking about everything coming back around and studying the past masters. Yes. And I was telling you when I'm walking down on Broadway, I still hear that song, which is a testament to its, its uh, longevity coming out of some of the, the clubs down there on Broadway. And you were telling me a story about some of these artists that oh, hear that song as well or rediscover that, that well song? i i keep i <laughs> keep um all the new kids yeah that i work with um they all do they all come up to me when they find out that i produce yeah. that and say oh i i play that song in my show right, and it's right. a big one and maybe we ought to you know reconsider cutting it again and you know and so it, it's nice to have one thing that still holds up right um that record still holds up when you hear it on the uh on the radio to this day and there's no bass guitar really? in the verses wow well there's no bass guitar at all it's a keyboard bass crazy but never noticed the that. verses yep <laughs> you, you won't notice in the verses there's no bass guitar and that's what makes when it, then, then it comes in a keyboard bass and the reason that was is because um, the when we were rehearsing it with the Dirt Band, the bass player said, "I want to play mandolin on the ah. track." So we played a, you know, it was Jeff Hanna and, uh -huh. and Jimmy Ibbotson, and they were playing acoustic and mandolins and and stuff. And so the keyboard player just said, "Okay, well, I'll for right now, I'll yeah. just do this." And it ended you up guys being, loved it, yeah. yeah. So so, but it also has like a swing to it when I'm when thinking about that song. Was that a conscious decision? Was that on the demo? It, you know what? I have to say there was a really good, the, the writers of that song, Jim Photoglow and Wendy Waldman, good friends of mine, and they had that swing going on yeah. already yeah. Uh, in the acoustic guitar. So they had a, a demo. It wasn't what we ended up doing and we did i don't like to copy demos i like i i think a demo is a demo you should always try to beat the demo right even if it's a great demo try to figure out a way um yeah to to beat the demo and if it's so amazing then why don't you just use the release it as a master yeah. you know yeah because yeah. that's the demo artists is uh, <laughs> you know a lot of artists get well that. and then all those demo guys we were talking about working up the chain as a, as a session guy they're like they stole my sig lick you know it's right. like it's just the same thing yeah so uh you know but as far as that period when you produced do you remember what studio you guys cut that yes, song it was the loft okay it's called the loft and it was in the old warner brothers building which is now is around the corner of 19th and division there okay okay um, is that where they're building the new virgin <laughs> mega hotel i can't remember uh yes <laughs> right across it's down the street from the murder mart there. okay yeah, yeah right exactly yeah. yeah no that's i think that is where they're building the yeah huge uh second floor it was the it's called Branson. the loft and it was okay. a very small little studio and um and you cut the whole record there in the only, smaller uh, yeah well i only did half the album okay. uh paul worley and jim i mean Marshall Morgan and Paul Whaley yeah. did half of it, and I did the other half. And um, I had t two number ones on 
on my side of the record, and they, I think they had one. Yeah. Well, gosh, that's a, yeah. a big album. And back then, were you using the same crew of guys well, those, like you're doing now? You know, no. Or, uh, I used the dirt band. Right, the, the actual musicians. Um, wow, but, look at but Paul and, 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 and Marshall were not. Ah. Um, and the same thing happened when I produced Alabama. I said, I'll use you guys. I started using them, and yeah. then um, Randy came to me and said, it's not, don't use yeah. us. Well, and, and I don't know if our viewers, since once again we have viewers from all over the world, understand that in, in Nashville it's pretty, you know, it's a division between the live guys typically and the studio guys. And uh, the, some people have mixed them up. And Yeah, I mean, I try to if I can. Uh, yeah. The bass player from Alabama, Teddy Gentry, played on all of the records that I produced. So it wasn't like nobody from the band played on it. Right. And Jeff played every once in a while on guitar and Randy's singing yeah. and they all sang on the record. Mm -hmm. So they are participating on the record. But yeah. in Nashville, a lot of times you have so many great s session players that um, it's, it's a different thing it live. Is. Yeah and session mm -hmm. are two different things and, and and it goes the other way around too a lot of session players are not very good live players right. because they they're staring at their shoes they're staring <laughs> at their shoes and they want to yeah. sit down while right, they play right, and right. you know yeah they're not entertainers yeah. yeah so as far as um can you t give us a little bit more lessons a few more lessons as growing as a producer because you said you kind of yes matured uh here in nashville definitely from um, that time period maybe to now yes you know that um, I, the more I produce, the less I do. Right. Okay. Um, you, you have to feel secure in letting go and knowing that, uh, okay, so I'm a session guitar player mm -hmm. and I made my living doing that. So the first couple records I produce, I would go in and I would make these elaborate demos of the songs with me playing all these parts. And I would come in and I would say, here's your parts, guys. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Play these parts. And I find that a lot of the college kids that I've talked to through the years that control. do the same like, thing. I, wanna keep that. I want to yeah. I want the control, the ego factor. Yeah. Feed that ego. Those are my parts. Here yeah. it is. Um, <coughs> you can do that. Mm -hmm. And and God bless you if you can. <laughs> because, but I learned you can do that after the fact. You should, before, you should go in and say, play whatever you hear. Right. Because if I don't say that, I'll never know. Yeah. Something you, totally cool so, some out of left field. Some amazing thing out of left field that yeah. I would have never thought yeah. of that you can do it. Now, if they play their parts and you don't like it, I go home and I'll replace the guitars. But it, 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 it probably doesn't happen hardly at all now. Now I know what I can do and, and I know what they're going to kind of do or I lean on them to go, right. hey, do your sound effects thing. Sure, sure. Or do yeah. your, you know, that thing that you do so well. But that goes back to knowing your guys. You know what they're knowing your guys. But it also it also goes to allowing your your players to feel like they're contributing. Okay. People want to contribute. Yes. Creatively, if you're if they're playing a part that's just on the demo, it, note for note exactly, right. they don't really they're not going to give you a hundred percent. They'll give you eighty percent, eighty five percent. It'll just be a thing of, hey, honey, how was your day? Oh, I copied a demo. Right. Wasn't very right. much fun. Right. As opposed to, man, we killed it today. Sure, sure. We we went somewhere yeah. different. Well, that that's we've like never anything gone. else. Like you know, if you're CEO of a, CEO of a company, gives give the employees some buy-in. You know, give them some stock. You know, yeah, that exactly. kind of thing. Just, and and just, so yeah. with that, I, I I find that I'm doing less and less these days. Um, Smart and yeah. and. My records, I think, are are better now than they ever have been because there are more people involved creatively, and I mean the second engineer too. <laughs> um, well, if I say anybody got an idea, I mean anybody well, got an idea. And, but that's what I was going to ask you. Coming from a musical background, do you? I know some producers really want to jump on there and, and once again that control thing. They want to push everything on Pro Tools, or do you want to sit back and? And listen and, and delegate the technical side of things. I mean, do you have a team there? Yeah, you um, trust. I, or... I have, um, I have a guy who uh, does digital editing for uh -huh. me. 
So what that means is I have a guy that will tune vocals comp. for me. Well, no, not comp, because you, no, might, you I, might I be. comp yeah. with the artist. Okay. My favorite thing, uh, way of doing it is, is teaching the artist how to get the best vocal for themselves and sitting down with them. And because it's so easy to comp with Pro Tools now. Right, right. Um, analog was a, it was just a piece of paper with little columns right. <laughs> down there and you would check yeah. marks and you would listen yeah. and then you would go back and on a little switcher box oh, and gosh. try to put it all together. Yeah. Um, now, you know, it's so easy with Pro Tools that yeah. it, I like to have the artist sit down with me and teach them and, and say, do you like this, the way you sing it better here? Make them pay attention to the six or seven or eight times that they sang it. Wow. Pay attention, wow. okay? I know they're not all the yeah. same, and you're yeah. going you're gonna to get better at the end of this record together. With I think me that's really cool because most, most producers, and it goes back to the control thing, will do that by themselves and then just present it to the artist, but you're actual teacher you're teaching the artist as you I, I want them to learn i want them to 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 uh, because a lot of times your first record you know you're so you it can be so intimidating right. Right. I mean, I remember doing a session for the first time. It was intimidating. I almost threw up yeah. uh, going in there because I thought, oh, my God, my guitar sounds like crap. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah. you can hear all the little things. I didn't know. It's <laughs> live. You can't hear this that, stuff. That microscope, yeah, yeah. in the studio, yeah. Oh, gosh. Well, uh, but but as far as the technical stuff, you're, you are doing some of it, it sounds like. I am right. doing a lot of it. I, I'll do overdubs at my house. I'll, I'll record the – I have a studio at my house, and I will record the lead vocals uh, if they want to, yeah. if they want to go into another studio, we'll go into another studio, but if they want to, they can do it at my house and I'll record them. I'll be the engineer. Um, and then we'll get it down. We'll comp together and then I'll send it off to somebody to right. touch up, do a little, um, tuning. I, I don't, unless I'm getting into a lot of, uh, overdubs with, um, a, B B a lot stuff. of loops and oh, no, okay. a lot oh. of loops and stuff. If there's a lot of stuff that, uh, then I, oh, I, I may that. send it off to somebody to pocket to some pocket yeah. with the grid exactly. Yeah. Right. If not, um, you know, if you're using Near Z, who I use yeah. on drums, he's an amazing drummer, you and you you don't <laughs> you know you don't worry about that very yeah. much. You just go, hey Near, play with the click. And then sending off the mix or mixing yourself. Or no, I send it off to mix. I don't, yeah. I'll do really good rough mixes myself. So that the the, Get an idea. The, the the engineer, the mix engineer, has an idea of uh, how I'm con uh, perceiving it, panning wise, or, or or whatever it is. But other than that, it's their game. Yeah, they can do the delays or whatever. So that's what I was going to ask you: is how has the rise of the home studio impacted your producing and engineering? And it, you kind of already answered that question, but I guess the 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 one question I have unanswered is how. How many days are you spending in this large studio uh, for tracking um, as far as some of your budgets? Are you going there five days and hoping out to knock out a, a master recording um, to a big studio and then bringing it back home for overdubs? I wish we had five, <laughs> five days to do yeah. tracks. That yeah. was the old way of doing right. it. Two, so how two songs a day, that was the old way of doing it. So you're, having, you're expected to get more now, or the oh, budget's dictating oh, that? Oh, it's really? Budgets that are, sounds like demo land. So it, it's, it's very, very close. close. It's, very, it's, it's gotten very uncomfortably close to demos. Yeah. Um, I just did on Drew Bulge's record, we uh, cut two songs in a session, um, and they were raising their eyebrows at me, like, really, can't we get three, you know? The, right. The powers that be were like, Gosh. can't you get three songs yeah. in that three hour session? You know, one right. an hour. And I'm like, sure, I can, you know what I can, if you want, I can get 10. <laughs> okay, I can get 10. But uh, right. there's going to be a difference, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. it, it's going to be autopilot versus right. it's, creativity. Yes, and, and I, that's what I've heard sometimes people, at least their complaint about Nashville is that if you don't have any time, you're not going to take chances. I mean, if the guys, if the right. studio players know if I mess up, well, I'll just play my old lick that I know and... And, uh, exactly. Or I won't even, I'm, I'll, you'll find out later that I made a mistake. I don't even, you <laughs> I know, like that. Oh, you can fly that. You're now. right. That's, right. that's the like new that. thing yeah. is how you can just fly, fly the first course <laughs> into the second one for right, me, will you? Right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take it to one last break and we'll be back with Josh Leo. See you guys in a second. I have a gift of playing music. That's what I got. I was pretty much afraid of everything. 
afraid of the world, afraid of speaking. Music was the voice I didn't have. Welcome back to the last segment of The Producer's Room. I'm your host, Dave Tuff, and we're here on Music Row with Josh Leo. And we were just talking about production and songwriting and all that stuff. And now we're moving to our rapid fire segment. So this is the, this is the segment where I ask you five, six random questions and uh, you have to think about them real quick, hence mm -hmm. the name. So three to five, and you can go up to five, Desert Island albums and maybe a quick explanation of uh, what, it, what you like about those records. Um, you're stuck on an island, you got five records. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I don't know the exact names of them, but early Randy Newman, early yeah. Ry Cooter, um, Pet Sounds. Yeah. Um, those are good, three good ones. <laughs> yeah, that's probably... Yeah. Okay, I like that, yeah. I like that. And we were talking about going back and learning some of the history. Pet Sounds is definitely one of those that you have to you have to teach and just you dissect. know I mean the fact that those are all orchestra a lot of yeah. orchestra instruments and it was pop music yeah you know yeah. Um, it really and if you go back and listen to some of the recordings of him talking to the musicians and how he mm -hmm. got put the accordions there the accordions need to be closer <laughs> together and right. all this stuff right. and he's singing parts yeah uh, how it's can amazing. you not love that okay since you're a songwriter and established songwriter and in, in a lot of these different with a lot of different artists favorite song with a woman's name i have to go with walk don't walk away renee because Ooh. my wife's name is renee Ooh, I, I like wouldn't that. say it's my favorite but i've got to say you know i've got to yeah i yeah. like that betty like davis <laughs> eyes would be up there too you know? <laughs> yeah, all right because okay. you know you played all on right. that one yeah, too yeah. uh favorite song about driving uh, I can't drive 55. Ooh, oh, yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Sammy Hagar. All right. Uh -huh. All right. So if you had one superpower, what would it be and why? <laughs> superpower. Yeah. So um, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm Stan Lee. I can gift you with, with any superpower. Uh, invisible. Ooh. I would like to be invisible because um, even though I'm, you know... I'm an extrovert, but uh -huh. when I go home, <laughs> I'm not. I really, right. so there are a lot of music business functions that I would love to be able to just yes. be yeah. invisible. Well, maybe you can clone yeah. yourself and send the clone That would them. be wonderful. <laughs> I would love to, to sit around rooms. at home. Okay, and last but not least, the world is ending, and uh, you have a few more minutes, and you get to hear one more song. Um, oh, yes. What a Wonderful Life. Uh, right here's uh, oh, the, Louis Armstrong. Yes. 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 Oh, yes. That, Great. That, That's that a, would be my last as, request. As the, uh, as the asteroid's about to hit. Yes. Look, I can that see the movie. The asteroid's coming down, and that song is playing, and I'm like, this yeah. is perfect. We're gonna, and five, four, three, <laughs> right. and you're out. Yep, exactly. Okay, cool. So we have a few more kind of these deep questions. Feel free to say just pass if you, if you want to, but... Um, what is your greatest accomplishment to date? My greatest accomplishment is I'm a character on South Park. Ooh, you I'll are. Explain. How, yes, how I'll did that explain. Happen? I'll explain. Yeah, I play. I, I was in Jimmy Buffett's band for six years. Uh huh. Um, the creators of South Park used to come to the shows. They were they were Parrot Heads. Okay. And um, we did a live. DVD down in Miami called Live by the Bay. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Parrot Head uh, fanatic, you'll know the DVD. Um, and it was in 1985 or 86, I believe. Okay, now, that is a big DVD amongst Parrot Heads. And obviously, Trey Parker and those guys, they, they must have seen it or uh -huh. known about it. Fast forward to... AIDS Burger in Paradise, which is a <laughs> which is a South episode, Park episode. A South Park episode. Well, what's what season is that? Well, it I don't matter, know. I guess. You we'll, can just put in AIDS Burger yeah, in Paradise. We'll, we'll find it. Up. I'm sure. Um, but Elton John is supposed to oh, like gosh. play, and he gets sick, and so they have Jimmy Buffett, and Cartman hates Jimmy Buffett, but 
they show Jimmy Buffett playing AIDS burger in Paris, <laughs> and they oh, widen out, and here is there I am wearing the exact outfit, <laughs> white overhauls with no shirt, <laughs> with the Les Paul playing oh, through a gosh. box which says V A U X or something oh, like gosh. that. Uh, from that that film. So there I am. I, that's the greatest accomplishment. Whoa, that's a pretty good one. South Park character. I like that. Yeah. We could probably even look that up online and, and find it somewhere. The uh, Actually, you sent me a friend, a friend request. Mm -hmm. It's my picture on Facebook. So okay. I'll answer that okay. request and you'll be able to oh, see I, it. Oh, I want to I see that. Okay. okay. So a little bit deeper, like I said, how do you balance family life and a busy production and songwriting schedule. I know it can be really hard in this town. It, it's easier now that my son is, is yeah. 26 and grown up. It was really hard when he was in school. Um, I missed a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, I traveled a lot. Um, so I don't really recommend it, but um, it's much easier now because <laughs> now nobody gives a shit if dad's home or not. Right, you right, know? right. Uh, my wife uh, teaches at Belmont. And, yeah, yeah. You know. Good. Um, okay. Um, this is, once again, don't have to answer it. W number one, what are you best at? Number two, what are you afraid of? Musically? Anything. Life, music. Oh, um... I think I'm, uh, hopefully I'm best at being peaceful and happy and, and turning people on to that philosophy. Yeah. yeah. And what I'm afraid of is I'm really claustrophobic, <laughs> especially like in well, we want elevators. To, yeah, and, we want and, and, you know, the thought of being in a really closed uh, casket or something is yes. terrifying. Okay, well, we won't do any of that to you right now. <laughs> Dave, please don't. But, but you know what I've noticed about the best producers is they are, uh, they're going to be on the positive side. They're, they're always encouraging. And I've been told by s some weirdos, yeah, the best producer was like Phil Ramone when he took the gun to the... But we all know that's not true. I mean, that's not the motivation that people get longevity out of. It's that, it's that positive energy, those positive vibes and... Yeah, I, I, I really think that if you're going to be a producer, um, you need to be a people person. You, know, you need to know how to put people at ease and feel very comfortable because the studio, the clock is ticking and the money is going yeah. like crazy. And you have to learn how to make everybody relax and not think about ticking down and right. money going and we only have 10 more minutes we got to get one more track <laughs> yeah. you know that's because stress, we all yeah. you, uh, the stress of that mm -hmm. you, you you need to i think more than anything else you need to be able to it's good give that um a couple of mistakes you made in the past that you would encourage others students others other peers not to make um or one or two you know don't be um i have a bad habit of being sarcastic and trying to be funny and it's blown up in my face a couple of times like yeah. um i wrote a song with john rich before john rich became the john rich the, the <laughs> john rich and um clay walker cut it and he called me he was really excited and he said josh clay walker just cut our song he left a message on my phone and so being the funny sarcastic guy yeah. i called him back and said great we're batting a thousand let's never write a song again <laughs> and we never did ah uh, yeah i see what you're saying um, yeah yeah so uh and and i would also say don't hold a don't hold a grudge in this town this town is too small the music business is too small don't hold a grudge when you're a producer as soon as you get the job, the clock is ticking and you're going to be fired. Right. It's going to happen. It's just going to happen. Get used to that. Mm -hmm. I heard Dan talk about not mm -hmm. working with, you know, Keith and, and uh, Rascal Flats and stuff. It, right. it happens. Right. You, you're going to be on top and then you're going to be handed the door. It all goes in, in circles, up, yeah. ups and downs and ebbs and flows. Um, Two more questions, and then uh, I'm going to kind of turn it over to you if you have any other advice for our, our viewers. Anyone you want to be more like? Or you could th look at it this way. If you could be anyone else besides yourself, who, who would you be? 
Uh, if, you, if you want to think of it that way. Um, besides the Dalai Lama, don't <laughs> yes, laugh. That's a good I know, one. but that that would be my first one. Is to be able I think to, that's awesome. To be able to be that. But you may be able to be him <laughs> in the next life. I'm I, just kidding. Maybe I would. <laughs> there you go. So I got that going for me. Um, <coughs> no. Uh, yeah, I like that. Uh, and I would say, and then as far as producers go, I had great uh, admiration for Film Ramones and the and the. Uh, um, Wexlers and the yeah. Do Tom Dowds and, and those guys. Um, I got to work with Tom Dowd one time oh, wow. on a Rita Coolidge record and, and it was just wonderful. Those guys are a whole nother generation yeah. of, of coolness. Oh, I'm sure. Um, at Erdogan and those people. You know. Um, Phil Ramone, yeah. Was, yes. Yeah. Did I say Phil Ramone or I meant, said, I meant Phil Spector with said, the gun? You meant Phil Spector. Yeah, that's but I, who knew, I, meant. I knew. Yeah, you meant we that. were. I, Phil I'm, Ramone won, yes. was a wonderful he, producer and another very guy. Very warm. Very yep, warm and another guy that you can learn how to be the people person yes. and make everybody feel at home. And it's a, it's you know, and yeah. and and the artists they all love those kind of uh -huh. people. You know. Yeah. Okay. So finally, uh, what are you working on right now? We know that you are working with Dustin and uh, Love and Theft. And Actually, all that. I, I I don't want to burst your bubble, but I wrote that. Wrote song. wrote the Dustin. Okay. I well, did, either I way, I mean, produce, uh, um, I'm working with uh, Drew Baldridge, um, who is Joe Baldridge. Yeah, cousin. Joe, a famous. Well, yes. He is famous, isn't he, Joe? Yeah. I work with him every day, so it's hard to think of. But yeah. an engineer, so yeah. Uh, yes, and uh, he's on a new label called Cold River Records, and his first single will be coming out in um, January. And what I really like about it is that it's we're already getting requests from the radio station saying, take the horns off. Oh, okay, okay. So that so, means they're going to play it, right? Yeah. They're going to play it, but it's like, it's, um, I don't know, it's, we're, we're really going out there. Well, that's good. We were just talking about breaking yeah, some new yeah, ground. Yeah, we're, we're really breaking some new ground with Drew. I mean, yeah. he's, a, he's, a, he's a country singer, definitely, but he's really gotten into groove and dance stuff, and he loves to have horns nice. on his stuff. And so it's a real breath of fresh air for the cool. musicians to, yeah. to get in there and be doing something that that harkens back to maybe a different time period. That's cool, man. And then uh, a, a guy by the name of Casey Donahue, a Texas guy, uh, just finished doing a record on him. Hopefully, he's going to bust out. This is like his fourth record, and he does really well in the in the red dirt area yeah. of Texas and, yeah. and stuff like that. Um, Very cool. So. Yeah, and a couple other people that I'm developing. Nice, some nice. People. And you're so, still writing and writing I'm, with some I'm, of these artists. I'm, I'm definitely writing with these artists. Still playing guitar? Or? Yes, I play yeah. guitar on every record that I produce. Man, that's so cool. Still using all, all the skills you got. All, all well, the chops. you know what? Um, it's hard to be in the music business these days, kids. <laughs> you better use every weapon yep. you have. Yep, 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 yep. Well, where can people find you? Do you uh, do you have a website? Or... I do not have a website. But they can look you up online. They can and, look me uh, up online. Yes. I mean, you've already given us all these DVDs that you're on and albums. We could probably look those up and um, listen to. I, and, and I write. If you need to contact me, I write for Cobalt. Yes. Yes. So you can contact me there. Um, I'm always looking for new talent. I'm always looking for. Uh, do people. they need to move to Nashville, or um, you would probably encourage it? You know, it, it depends. I mean, I say move to Nashville if you want to be in the music business, not the country music business, right. the music business. I really think that this town is going to grow and grow and grow into what L.A. was yeah. in the 70s, uh -huh. in 60s and 70s, and what New York was in, in the 60s yeah. as well. I really think this is the new place for people playing together in a mm -hmm. room we're still tracking that way we're yep. still yep. making those records uh, americana is really taken off in this town there's rap in this town mm -hmm. there's all kinds of music i mean i it, it i think it's more music city now than it's ever been i agree i agree well man we could talk for another hour but i i really appreciate your time Josh, it's a blast and, and i hope yeah. you kids um, listen to Dave <laughs> when he's talking to you because so. he knows what he's talking about. The students. And he's bringing in some good people. So yeah. this is a good thing. Well, thank you so thank much. Thank you very man. much. It's a pleasure. Yeah. Okay, guys. Well, 
We're going to wrap this one up and I'll see you on the next episode of The Producer's Room.